That's I started shouting my mouth off on air. It's not the news. It's an entertainment show. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Phil Jupiter. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much. Now, I, uh, let me look at... Right, there's a tiny person there. Hello. What's your name? Reed. Cool. How old are you, Reed? Nine. Yeah, we're going to be fast-tracking your language tonight, son. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you grew up in a pub. Dear boy, you probably know more words than me. <laughs> so, uh, hi. Reed's over here. He's nine. And uh, his book comes out in, <laughs> in 20 years. It's called How I Killed a Fat Man. <laughs> When Buzzcocks captain Phil Jupitus appeared in Winchester this week, he spoke exclusively to Winnell. In this brutally honest interview, he reveals the truth behind his departure from BBC Six Music. Thank you, my friend. Very, very good to be here. When you take a gig on, and then you kind of, when you get to like four years through it, you think, this ain't quite right, and you can't figure out what's not right about it. I mean, it's very well paid. I love doing it, but I stopped doing it because, you know, ultimately it was just not a good fit for me. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, you you said you know in the book it was the BBC Six music. Yeah. It was you know you had a big sort of fall up. It was a spectacular bust up. I read. Yeah. Um, but you did mention that if that had not happened, you'd maybe still be working there now. Do oh, you yeah, wish no, that? Uh, that there was like? no, that was one incident that happened after I'd left them. They used to have me back to sit in for people. But then I did a show on air and, and I, I, I spoke out of turn on air. Which is always the worst thing to do when you're DJs is, 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 is the... Although, although sometimes it can be the best thing that you do is actually to kind of speak quite plainly and speak the truth. But um, there was a lot of fuss about, um, about people altering the results of competitions and pretending people had phoned in. Well, any radio show that's pre-recorded is pretending, is lying from the get-go. And on Christmas Day... All of the radio shows you listen to, or 99% are pre-recorded. Because no one goes to work on Christmas Day. So there's just one dude in the studio playing stuff out. And so, of course, they act like they're live. And that in and of itself is, is a conceit, is a deceit. And so when people, you know, the, uh, the right-wing media were getting very up at it about the BBC, you're rigging competitions... Well, you just want the show to sound vibey and like people are calling in. They weren't corruptly giving away prizes to other people. They were just saying someone had won it when they hadn't, just to try and make the show feel live. And it was one of the most ludicrous overreactions to just common sense that I'd ever heard. And there was a very interesting thing. The, the, the show where I had the fallout uh, was supposed to be the greatest collaboration records of all time. And uh, it was a vote done with the Six Music uh, listeners. And so... It's, you know, the, that was, that was the, the title of it. And the record that won was an album track by Sinead O'Connor with a New Zealand pipe band, the title of which I can't remember. That was the number one collaboration record of all time because the Sinead O'Connor website had said, oh, there's this thing going on, let's get this record to number one, we can do it. There's 500 of us online now, let's rig this competition. And they blew the results out of the water because the BBC, because of all this sensationalism about tinkering with competitions... Uh, they'd, uh, they'd left the results alone and so that's I started shouting my mouth off on air about the Sinead O'Connor fan club basically but uh, you know what when you're making radio you've got to show common sense and that means ed exercising editorial control and you know sometimes you know that, that does involve what, what at worst I would call white lies you know <laughs> just you're just making something a piece of entertainment you know it's not the news, it's an entertainment show, and so things will happen. Ex-colleague of yours, uh, I say colleague, possibly friend, Mark Lamar, yeah, yeah. was announced a few days ago that he was leaving Indeed, radio for yes, a yeah. similar reason. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you support that, I yeah, guess. Totally. Where is radio headed when these big presenters are leaving? For well, these I mean, reasons? Radio 2, despite the fact that, that, that subsequent to Mark's announcement said, uh, we have a commitment uh, to, um, to um, more alternative music styles on Radio 2, well, I'm afraid that the people that they're hiring to present shows does not match up with that commitment. You know, they're, 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 the people that they're hiring are very mainstream. You know, it's, uh, and you just, you need someone, every radio station needs, needs presenters who management don't have to be frightened to leave alone to do their own thing. And, and, you know, 
that always, to me, reflects, I think, well on the station. If they've got people that know their business, you know, one of the greatest, you know, scandals of, of, of the way the BBC acted was that, that, that they, t they were tacitly trying to get rid of John Peel from the mid-80s through to the mid-90s just by sho shoving his time slot around and hoping that he'd just get pissed off and leave. They treated him incredibly shabbily, the BBC, throughout his career. And I, I, and I just... I just think that what happens is, is that when you're, when you're on the presenting side of things, you arrive and you're a presenter and that's it and that's what you do all your life. When you arrive at the BBC and you work back in the scenes, you arrive as a BA and then you get promoted to being a producer and then you get promoted to being an editor and then you get promoted to being a, you know, a, a, a station controller and then you can get promoted to being head of radio and then you can get promoted to be the DG of the BBC there's a career arc whereas a presenter arrives and is a presenter throughout their entire life and they, 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 what they do doesn't change they just get better at it whereas the people that get promoted uh, their imagination and, and so forth is limited by, by the arc of their career and so as people advance higher up in the BBC they become, they become I think they become less creative and they become much much better at handling life as um, you know, within a corporation, they, they become more corporate. And that is just the nature of the BBC. It's not their fault and they don't do it deliberately. So these are the people now? That yeah, people now. that run the BBC, yeah, 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 yeah. I think the last, the last decent DG had, I mean, who understood that people need to be left alone to do their job is Greg Dyke. Whereas, whereas now what you've got is a Director General who spends most of his time apologising to the right-wing media, media that speaks for 10% of the population, if that. Uh, Daily Mail think they're the voice of the British people, uh, The Sun and The Times think they're the voice of the British people, and they're not, they're the voice of their paymasters, which is Rupert Murdoch and Lord Brothermere, and, you know, the BBC is the voice of the British people. But that does put a lot of pressure on the BBC and the content. Well, uh, yeah, no, it's constantly under scrutiny. I mean, with Ofcom going now, with the cuts, uh, I mean, God, two years ago, was it two years ago? Yeah. Where are we now? Do you remember? So not the Edinburgh Television Festival, just gone the one before. Uh, James Murdoch and Cameron have already stitched up what Tory media policy is. Okay, it's already been decided. I'll ask you one more question before you yeah. go for here for your book. Yes, indeed. Anything in the future? What's coming up? Uh, I'm, um, yes, uh, funnily enough, I'm uh, back into musical theatre. I'm appearing in Spamalot uh, for five months as King Arthur from the end of January, starting in Plymouth. And I think ending, if I'm correct, in Southampton in June. So, yeah, I'm going to be on the road uh, in a Monty Python musical which is, as a fan. It's a real honour. Fantastic. Thanks very much for talking Thanks, Steve. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Are you crocheting or knitting? Knitting. Sweet. <laughs> I don't know the difference. <laughs> one needle for crochet. You can knit with one needle. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> This is the best tour I have ever done. <laughs> Why one needle? Why don't if you, you crochet, need... you need one needle. One needle, yeah. that's it. And then it's just knotting around you. So hopefully one stick. Sweet. Do you do crochet? Yeah. yeah. Are you good at it? No. No? Why not? Because I don't do it enough. You don't do it enough? You want to uh, up your game. <laughs> <laughs> I do spin. That red scut... What? I spun it. You spun. You spun your own wall. <laughs> <Yes>. Leave. <laughs> Get out! Thank <laughs> you.